Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to our distinguished lecture talk uh, today. Uh, we are here from ETH in Zurich. Uh, she's now there in the system professor. She's been before in, uh, in the US, in uh, Georgia, as well as uh, in Illinois. <coughs> and uh, she is uh, working on optimization and decision intelligence. And she's a scholar and she has gained a lot of awards uh, from AI stars and several others. She's regularly serving as an area chair mm -hmm. in all the conferences we know of. And uh, before I say too many words, Let's uh, start with the talk. Uh, really looking forward to it. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, and also thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure and a great honor also to be here and to finally meet many of the Ellis uh, scholars and members here at uh, uh, Stuttgart. So today I'm going to uh, introduce some of our very recent work uh, and try to really to demystify many of the you know puzzles about adaptive gradient methods. In machine learning. And this is joint work with uh, three of my PhD students uh, at ETH Zurich. So I guess it goes without saying that uh, optimization plays a pillar role in the whole data to decision pipeline in machine learning. And uh, this is either for the pattern recognition part or for the decision making part, or when we have a feedback loop like in reinforcement learning. And optimization really provides a lot of fundamental principles for us to design and analyze algorithms uh, in machine learning so that we can have not only just computation efficiency, but also with good generalization performance, with robustness, and also with ad adaptivity. And uh, in the past, we have seen a lot of success of machine learning. Like it has really done very well on stationary data, like images and text. Right, especially even if uh, data are somehow is uh, missing the decentralized rather than centralized here. So either when data is decentralized or come from multiple domains or from multiple tasks, right? Oftentimes we can. Uh, sorry, it's a bit slow there. So we can cast these problems as a risk minimization problem, right? This is a common approach where we try to minimize the collective risk over all the data we have seen. And uh, on the other hand, in the recent years, we have seen a lot of emerging applications from machine learning where data are now generated from a non-stationary environment. Right? This could be due to adversarial interactions with the environment, or could be due to like strategic behaviors of your agents, or just the system dynamics underneath of the environment. And this really drives to a huge kind of paradigm shift from risk minimization to min-max optimization, where we try to, where there are two agents, right? One agent tries to minimize your cost function and the other agent tries to maximize it. And uh, instead of trying to find an optimal prediction or optimal classifier here, we're really trying to uh, find an equilibrium, right, for these two agents. <coughs> So that is, uh, and we see that there are lots of applications with min-max optimization, and that really has been the key driving force behind the many, I would say, many major fields in, in reinforcement <coughs> learning, uh, in machine learning. And one of the most prominent, and perhaps also a bit out of fashion example is the generative adversarial networks, where we train two agents, one for the generator and one for the discriminator simultaneously. Right, the generator tries to generate some fake images to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator tries to distinguish from the fake images from the real ones. And this can be naturally formulated as a min-max optimization and has to lead to a lot of success in like image synthesis, in text generation, in imitation learning for uh, in practice. And last time when I gave a talk and, uh, inter and used GAMS as a, my motivational application, and I was told that uh, the only people who still talk about GAMS are theoreticians these days. <laughs> and you ha have clearly seen a huge drop of interest on GAMS these days in major machine learning conferences. So on top, uh, besides GAMS, I think uh, another uh, uh, min-max optimization formulation are also extensively used to improve robustness of deep learning models by casting a game between the adversarial attacker and also the defender. 
and this has shown a lot of uh, uh, applications in practice as well. So, and it has also been used to enforce like fairness by injecting some fairness constraints, as well as more evidently like in reinforcement learning where we teach agents or we train agents to play games among each other. So how do we solve these problems? One of the very fundamental and most popular algorithms that has been studied for decades is stochastic gradient descent. Right? In the very canonical form, right, stochastic gradient descent basically performs uh, the update as follows. At er every iteration, you're going to ge just generate one sample from your training data set or from your underlying distribution and use it to construct an unbiased stochastic gradient estimator, and then you're going to perform this type of update iteratively. Right? So this is kind of the very basic form of stochastic gradient descent. And you can, in the minimax optimization setting, you can also apply stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and here you can do just one stochastic gradient descent for player X and uh, a stochastic gradient ascent for player Y, right? And do, you do this alternatively or simultaneously. So needless to say, this is a topic that has been studied for a long time. I think uh, one of the very first papers that, that I read in machine learning is really this paper by Neon Bateau in uh, 2010. That's when I started my PhD. And that's really what intrigues me into this field. And uh, I spent the last 12 years working on machine learning. And uh, I'm surprised that until today, I'm still working on stochastic gradient descent. It's, it's also impressive to see the impact of stochastic gradient descent, I think, in the field. And uh, you see that uh, the impact has never faded in the past 10 years. And there was even a claim that saying gradient descent is essentially the part of a solution to human level AI, which shows its importance, but I'm not say, I'm, uh, this is not necessarily the truth, though. OK. So in one of the NeurIPS uh, workshop last year, there was a survey done uh, in the workshop uh, about which optimizer would you try first when you train a neural network model. And of course, not too surprisingly, Adam is the winner that uh, uh, among all of these uh, uh, respondents from uh, both academia and industry, and it is reported that over 80% among them would choose to use Adam. And uh, among all of these other adaptive gradient methods include, and also SGD, right? So in practice, people do observe a lot of uh, benefits of using adaptive methods, right? They're, tends to give you much better performance in certain tasks. Say, for example, in training large language models or in reinforcement learning generative uh, models. But it seems like in other tasks, like in computer vision, they may have not necessarily better performance than SGD. However, what's surprised to me is that uh, there is so far very little understanding about what is like a clear theoretical answer why is adaptive methods like Adam behave better than stochastic gradient descent. And this is what I'm trying to kind of shed the light on today and hopefully give you some insights, like what is exactly the benefit of adaptive methods over SGD in theory. So, so adaptive methods, most of them can be captured in this uh, very general form where we're going to use this uh, adaptive step size here, um, unlike in stochastic gradient descent, just eta t here. We're going to use this adaptive step size, which depends on the previous uh, gradients we use, right? We're going to use this to automatically adjust what is the step size on the fly. And on top of that, oftentimes, many of the adaptive methods also use this momentum, incorporate momentum in the search direction other than just using the pure stochastic gradient, right? Actually, you're going to use some moving average of your previous gradient to do the search. <coughs> so this in encapsulates all of these very popular variations, like say, for instance, the pioneering algorithm called Adagrad, and also the kind of the most popular one, Adam, although this algorithm is known to not necessarily converge, even in the very simple convex settings. But it still has shown good performance in practice. And also a theoretical fix to Adam, which is known as the AM Scrat, and this is the work that wins the ICLR outstanding paper in 2018, and among many others. So why do people use adaptive methods? Why would people prefer to use adaptive methods or to try these in practice? One of the key 
I think a feature of adaptive methods uh, is that these algorithms oftentimes does not need to know the underlying problem specific parameters. In, con in, con in contrast, if you look at stochastic gradient descent, we know that in theory, if your function f is smooth, and then stochastic gradient descent actually will converge if you select the step size appropriately. And uh, particularly if you select the step size eta t to be of order one over square root of t up to some constant eta. And this constant has to be smaller than, let's say, two over l, right? If it's small enough, uh, then you can show that this algorithm will actually converge and it will converge at an optimal rate, okay? So in practice, oftentimes we don't really know this smoothness level l and, uh, and we needed to really to tune very hard eta in order to make sure this algorithm like stochastic gradient descent work. On the contrary, with adaptive gradient methods, oftentimes we can freely choose this eta in the algorithm without much tuning, right? So, so this algorithm can converge in most cases without knowing this underlying problem, specific parameters like smoothness or the bound of your variance or other things. Right, so we say that this algorithm is, in fact, parameter agnostic. And there have been a lot of uh, uh, recent study tries to analyze adaptive gradient methods and try to characterize their convergence behaviors. I would say uh, the theories are far from satisfying, right? There were theories showing that like other type of algorithm will, may not necessarily always converge and it will only converge when you try to tune some of these hyperparameters in the way that you design the uh, adaptive surface size or in the momentum part. And uh, uh, most of these adaptive methods where people are able to prove convergence, they require, first of all, very strong assumptions like a bounded gradient, which we don't need it for stochastic gradient descent. And also, they can only, at the best, show that you can achieve the same convergence rate as stochastic gradient descent, but with much worse constant dependencies. Right, so this drives us to think about, you know, what is, sorry. What, is what are the really the provable benefits of adaptive gradient methods if you can only achieve the same rate and you require much stronger assumptions? So, I would say like a very common perception is that, uh, you know, the, the benefits of adaptive methods is really that you can achieve this other optimal convergence rate without knowing problem specific parameter, but then most of the known other algorithms require knowing the parameters in order to achieve good rate. And this has been also been uh, uh, called like universality of, uh, of adaptive methods. So, so here we've shown that actually this type, this folk norm may not necessarily hold. In particularly, if we think about stochastic gradient descent, right, the natural question is, does stochastic gradient descent converge without knowing the param these uh, problem-specific parameters like Lipschitz smoothness, right? Can, can stochastic gradient descent converge actually without knowing this big L, right? So particularly, let's think about uh, stochastic gradient descent with this step size one over square root of t, with any choice of eta here. So if you have ever run stochastic gradient descent yourself, you would know that if eta is too large, right, say greater than one over L, then this might mean that the iterates will diverge and particularly the gradient will diverge, right? If eta, if your step size is too large, the algorithm will actually diverge initially. But since we're using diminishing step size, right, if you keep increasing t, then this eta t would essentially drop down below one over L. And that means afterwards, SGD should be able to converge, right? You, some, after some point, SGD actually will converge, okay? So this is just a numeric observation or just a kind of an intuition. And we're able to actually fully characterize this behavior. And we've shown that if you have a smooth objective, and if you set the step size eta t to be of this order with any arbitrary eta, then actually stochastic gradient descent will also converge. And what's more interesting is that it's not only that it will converge, right? Actually, you can show that the bound of SGD is exactly, uh, is nearly, it has the same order as just the stochastic gradient descent with optimally tuned step size. Except that we are now suffer from this uh, exponential 
kind of large constant here, right? So, so the idea is, you can see that if the eta is, is very large, is too large, then initially your gradient will explode. You will suffer from very large gradients. That's why there is this exponential uh, constant factor here, which depends on, which grows exponentially in terms of L. And this is, I would say this is a very surprising fact to us because most of the existing analysis for stochastic gradient descent in the literature requires that the step size eta to be smaller than one over L. But this says you don't need that, right? This algorithm itself is parameter agnostic. It will always converge. And not only it will converge, it will converge in an optimal order. In an optimal, in an, uh, the order or the rate that it will converge is indeed optimal. However, it will suffer from this exponentially large constant because of this gradient exponential uh, explo explosion at the very early stage. And the natural question then is, is this really a proof artifact or is this something that's uh, fundamental about stochastic gradient descent? So is the exponential term unavoidable for stochastic gradient descent? Oops. So we've shown that actually you can easily construct some worst case, very hard instance, or not even hard instance, very simple functions, where the function is smooth. And if you use this step size here, you can show that the gradient norm after t number of iterations will be at least in this order, and it will actually suffer from this exponential term. And the simple example one can think of is just this, say, this one dimensional example where you have, say, uh, just two values here, right? A, a more flat regime part and also like a sharp regime here. If you start with the valley, some point, initial point here in this valley here, if your step size is very large, then you will keep increasing your objective function value until some point. And, and the increase of your function value will actually uh, grow exponentially in terms of eta times L. And at some point, you're going to basically jump to another more flat regime. And in this regime, you're going to perform like the normal stand stochastic gradient descent with more step size. And, and this is a, and it has already been shown that uh, with even this quadratic function, you would need like at the best, this is going to be the rate. You will be able to achieve a stationary point. So which means that this is indeed something unavoidable for stochastic gradient descent, although it converges order optimally, but it actually suffers from this bad constant. So do adaptive methods suffer from the same issue or not, right? That is kind of the next question. So let's just pick one example, for example, Adagrad, right? Which is kind of the most, uh, the simplest uh, adaptive methods. And even to make it even simpler, let's consider the norm version of Adagrad, where uh, we're not considering like a, a coordinate-wise update, a step learning rate, but rather we're going to just use the aggregated the squared gradient norm to adjust our step size. Okay, so this has been actually introduced and studied in a number of existing work, and we've shown that if you use this Adagrad method. And uh, if you have a smooth objective, actually this algorithm will converge. And particularly the average of your gradient norm is going to be bounded by these terms. And you can see that both of these terms are actually uh, optimal in the sense that if, you're, if there's no noise in your gradient where sigma is equal to zero, this gives you the rate one over square root of t, which is known to be optimal for first order methods with only gradient information. And if sigma is non-zero, right, this is also order optimal for among all kinds of stochastic first order methods. So what it says here is that in fact, Adagrad is both order optimal and it does not suffer from this exponential dependence as we see in stochastic gradient descent, right? So a lot of the, these constants we see there only depends linearly in your, uh, or at most quadratically in your smoothness parameter, but you don't see this exponential constant factor anymore. And our analysis is particularly uh, differs from some of the existing analysis for Adagrad. So most of the existing uh, analysis for Adagrad you see in the literature, people usually make an assumption like the gradient are bounded. So if your gradient is bounded, then of course this is not a fair comparison to stochastic gradient descent. 
right? Because stochastic gradient descent, we don't assume bounded gradient. And also, if you bound it, your gradient is bounded, then stochastic gradient descent would also not suffer from this gradient uh, explosion at the very be beginning if your step size is too large, right? So this is kind of some assumptions that mislead many of the uh, what's really going on uh, for these adaptive methods. So this is, of course, just one example, which is perhaps not too convincing. What about another example? What about other adaptive methods? Let's look, for example, normalize the classic gradient descent with momentum. So, so we know that if you don't add any, uh, if you just consider normalized the stochastic gradient descent, which is popularly used actually in practice, particularly like in, in, uh, in privacy learning and uh, like this normalization of gradient clipping is heavily used in, in training very large language models. But it's also known that if you don't, if you only purely use normalized stochastic gradient descent, it will actually not convert, right? It's actually by just purely normalizing your stochastic gradient, it will give you a strict positive bias in your, in your gradient estimation. So you need to include momentum. If you don't use normal, normalized gradient, just the SGD with momentum, this also is known to not necessarily convert, right? So, so it's really essential to have both normalized SGD plus momentum in order to show some convergence. So we shown that again, if you only assume smoothness of your objective and you use this uh, step size arbitrarily with arbitrary choice of gamma in your step size, in your learning rate, then again, you can show that this algorithm converge other optimally with this uh, exact, this optimal rate, one over t to the power of one fourth without suffering from any exponential uh, constant factors. So this is sort of another evidence that using uh, adaptive step size or using your previous gradient information to guide you to with the learning rate will help you. So a third example is say AMS grad, right? This is the kind of the theoretical fix of Adam because Adam is shown not necessarily to converge even for convex functions. And uh, so this uh, iClear paper in 2018 shows that if you're going to change slightly your, this way that you update your V function, which is the uh, aggregation of your past information, in Adam, basically you just use this V here to update your learning rate. Now the idea here is to say this V, if you keep adding new gradient there, uh, so, so this idea here is now you're going to use only the maximum value of your of your gradient information so that you can guarantee that your learning rate is always decreasing, right? It will not increase because if you don't take this maximum here, it might increase at some point. That's why Adam is not necessarily always converging. So how does this algorithm perform? So we analyze this algorithm and we show that this algorithm actually also does not suffer from this exponential constant factor. However, this algorithm will only converge suboptimally uh, in a suboptimal rate. In particular, this rate, even in the deterministic case, is much worse than what we see in Adagrad. And we've shown that this is indeed unimprovable, right? This is both and lower bound and upper bound. So the algorithm, although it converges, but it's actually very slow, right? The reason is really because we're using the maximum value here, and we know that this actually means that although your step size is not increasing, but your step size can be arbitrarily slow, can be very slow, right? That's why you have, you, you see this very slow convergence. And this also, I think a lot of people in practice also observe that although this algorithm is proposed as a fix to Adam, but actually in practice, it performs much worse than Adam, okay? And I think this result kind of explains why, why it does not have good performance in practice. And what's uh, even worse, we've shown that if you don't assume this bounded gradient assumption, and uh, if and if you noise here, this result is for the case where the noise is equal to zero, meaning that this is fully deterministic algorithm. If if the noise is non-zero, right, you are in this stochastic setting, you're using stochastic gradient, we've shown that this algorithm actually can converge arbitrarily slow, right? It can, it does not even give you this, uh, the convergence rate is, is basically can be arbitrarily slow in the sense that the order that we have there can be arbitrarily close to zero. So it's indeed a very poor algorithm in theory 
if you throw away this type of uh, bounded gradient assumption. If you impose this bounded gradient assumption, right, then you would be able to show that it actually achieves an order optimal rate. But then that is not a fair comparison to stochastic gradient descent. So you can also easily illustrate many of these uh, uh, algorithms. Like say, for example, here is a quadratic function and the neural network here. Right, you see with stochastic gradient descent, if you use different, particularly if you're using large, uh, if your Lipschitz constant, in fact, is very large, right, and you're using the same, so all of these use the same, like, eta in the algorithm. So, so stochastic gradient descent can easily, like, uh, diverge initially, but eventually it will actually converge. Right? It just takes time for it to converge. But then Allograd and the normalized SGD algorithms will not suffer from this uh, divergence initially, right? It will actually converge very smoothly from beginning to end. And this is also similar in neural network examples as well. So just to summarize, right, what is really the benefits of adaptive methods, right? So, uh, so I hope this kind of justifies that uh, I think the essence of using adaptive methods is not really trying to be parameter free or to be parameter agnostic, but rather to get rid of this uh, uh, exponential dependence on the, this exponentially large constants and, and to avoid this gradient explo explosion at the very initial stage of the algorithm. And this is kind of gives a clear theoretical justification for that. And a natural next question is then what about uh, you know, mean max optimization problems? In practice, people often observe that when training GAMS or training like uh, two agent reinforcement learning problems, using these adaptive methods like ADAM does not seem to give you a huge significant boost in terms of convergence guarantees. Right? We wanted to see what is exactly happening there. So if you are going to move from minimization to mean max problems, right, a very common practice or very natural idea is that we can just simply combine this adaptive step size with gradient descent ascent, this stochastic gradient descent ascent type of algorithm. Right? So basically for every iteration, you are going to do an adaptive gradient uh, descent for your X player, and you, you're going to do a great, uh, adaptive gradient ascent for your Y player. Right. Similarly, this V and M are defined by using this uh, uh, aggregated information of your previous uh, gradients. Right. Similar as what we did in the minimization case. So does this algorithm always converge with arbitrary eta x and eta y, as we see in the minimization case? So the answer to that is surprisingly no. Like. Uh, this adaptive methods, you think that it will adaptively choose the step size as you need, but actually in the min max problem, it turns out to be fundamentally more challenging. So here's just a simple, a very simple toy example where you have a quadratic objective here, which is smooth as well. And here are like <clears throat> some uh, implementation of these four, like Adam, M squared, and other grad GDA. And suppose the choice that you choose for this uh, eta in your adaptive step size, initial step size, eta y over eta x is equal to one, then you see that actually many of these algorithms, including GDA, right, a lot of these adaptive methods will actually diverge. If you increase your initial ratio a bit, right, to two, some of them will actually get stuck, right? If you keep increasing it all the way to say, eight, right, all of them will actually converge. So which means that this algorithm actually, the performance depends on this different choice of the eta, right? It's not really fully parameter agnostic because you really need to tune this eta x and eta y in order to make sure that it converge. And the fundamental reason here is because that for min max problems, unlike minimization problems, you do need to uh, satisfy the so-called time scale separation in order to guarantee convergence, right? So you have two players here, right? You want to make sure that one player is trained faster than the other one, right? So per particularly, if you have a min max problem, you want the max player to learn much faster than the min player, right? So that, uh, so basically you need, you want this ratio between eta y and the eta x to be large enough, meaning that 
for a fixed x, then that, uh, that uh, the algorithm will be able to learn essentially the best response, right? This guarantees stability of the algorithm. So in min-max optimization, it has been shown that this type of time scale separation, or this, the fact that this two you need a two time scale and the, the time scale ratio between eta y and eta x to be, uh, to be sufficiently large is indeed necessary for, to guarantee convergence for most non-convex settings. For convex concave settings, is a different story. So how do we make them truly adaptive, right? So, so a natural idea is then to say, how can we get rid of this, this necessity of having this time scale separation, right? We know that how we can make a minimization problem adaptive. We know how we can solve maximization pro problem adaptive. So why don't we just uh, solve them separately? Right, so, so the idea was then let's just to have a two loop algorithm where, where in the inner loop, we're going to just solve the maximization problem using some adaptive gradient methods. And then in the outer loop, we're going to just apply some adaptive gradient methods to minimize X. So this is in fact also commonly used in practice in training GAMS, right? The difference is that in practice, when people try to train GAMS, usually they would use a fixed number of inner loops, like five iterations that you are going to update Y, and then you update one iteration or one step for X. Here, we propose that you're going to actually decide how you're going to, uh, to stop your inner loop uh, based on some adaptive criteria, particularly once your gradient in terms of Y is small enough, you're going to then stop. So this algorithm is fully adaptive. So does it converge? So here again, the same example, right? We see before, uh, right? Under different choice of initial step size ratio, right? Gradient descent might convert, might diverge if the step size ratio is, is too small and it will converge if this is large enough. If we use the nested framework, right? You see that, it, oh, sorry. You see that in all of these cases, right, no matter how you choose your initial step size, eta, it will, it will always converge. Similarly, for adagrad, right, this algorithm, some of them might not converge initially if, it, if the step size ratio is too small, right? And we've shown that if you use this nested framework, it will always converge, no matter how you choose your initial step size. Same for AMSgrad, and also the same for Adam as well. So this is, in fact, a very, a generic framework that you can combine with any adaptive gradient methods and it will guarantee that your, your algorithm will be parameter agnostic. Yes? The x-axis on the previous plot, is it the number of outer loop iterations? Or is it the number of total steps? This is the number of uh, total steps. Okay. Right, this is the number of gradients that we evaluate. Mm -hmm. So can we uh, verify this in theory? So we've shown that if your objective is actually non-convex, strongly concave, then in fact you can achieve, by running this algorithm, you can achieve nearly the similar guarantees we see for uh, solving a non-convex minimization problem. Right, particularly if, if you if say sigma, which is your bounded variance, let's say if sigma is, is equal to zero, meaning that there is no noise in your stochastic gradient, then you will be able, to, then we, we can get this type of rate like one over square root of t, which is optimal among all deterministic algorithms. If your sigma is non-zero, right, you, this, the dominating term is going to be this part, which is one over t to the power of one fourth. Again, this is also optimal. So the algorithm, in fact, it's parameter agnostic because it does not require any knowledge about your condition number or about your smoothness, right? It just applies for any arbitrary chosen eta x and eta y in your step size. It achieves other optimal rates, right, in both deterministic settings and stochastic settings. It's, it's very generic. It, you can easily extend it to other adaptive methods. As long as they converge, then you can show the convergence here. Of course, there are some kind of uh, 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 undesired features, say for example, this is a double loop algorithm and in practice people hate to implement double loop algorithms because you have always needed to, to decide when you are going to terminate your inner loop. 
And, and also this algorithm, because uh, when we try to evaluate, when we're going to terminate the algorithm, we, we need some mini batch to evaluate how close your gradient is close to zero. So we need some mini batch, which in the stochastic setting, which means that this algorithm is, in fact, you need basically two protocols for the deterministic setting and the stochastic settings. Hence, it is not fully noise adaptive. So how can we fix this issue, right? So, so, so again, like if we think about what's really going on here, is that the reason why our the algorithms like purely directly combining the uh, the adaptive methods with uh, like this naive adaptive scheme does not really work is really because that each of these players x and y they're using their own gradient information to adjust their own step size, right? If you're going to use your own step size, your own gradient information, of course, this ratio between them would not really change, right? Would not change like, uh, so, so basically it means that if, you're able, if you wanted to make sure that the effective learning rate satisfies some time scale separation, you needed to be able to you know, coordinate with each other and leverage the gradient information of others to, to, to to, to adjust your step size in order to make sure that, okay, this ratio at some point will decrease to zero or be sufficient for convergence, right? You need some coordination. If you just use your own gradient information, then this will never achieve the, the separation you need. So how do we introduce some coordination among these, right? A very simple idea here we introduce uh, in the algorithm we call it the time scale adaptive uh, method, uh, TIADA, is that we are going to consider this max operator when we adjust our step size for X player, particularly we're going to take the maximum between VX and VY, and then we're going to just uh, adjust the step size based on this max operator, okay? In addition, we're going to choose two different uh, 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 parameter, alpha and beta here, and this alpha and beta in other grad, both of them are set to be one half. Here we're going to choose alpha to be slightly bigger than beta, okay? Just to coordinate that uh, uh, with the step size. So why we use this max operator here, right? So actually it's also quite intuitive. If you look at exactly what is the step size we use in the X update, right? This is the step size, eta X divided by the max between them, right? You can rewrite it as basically this rescaled factor times the typical step size we would use in Adagrad or Adam, right? This is kind of the typical step size, right? So it's basically a rescaled uh, adaptive step size. And if you look at this uh, rescaling factor here, and this basically means if the Vy, which is basically the gradient norm of Y, is very large, then this constant here, this factor here, this ratio here, then should be less than or equal to one, right? Because if this is large, then this is Vx divided by Vy, 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 and the Vy is larger than Vx, then hence this is less than one. And this means that basically if your gradient norm of Y is very large, that's, that means that Y has not converged yet, right? So you needed to really slow down your X update so that you allow more updates for X, for Y, in order to make sure that it will converge, right, for the inner maximization problem. So that's why this ratio guarantees that you will actually slow down your X update. If your Y, VY is, uh, is less than VX, that means your Y update is already more or less uh, converging, right? Your gradient norm of Y is very small, right? That's when you wanted to, uh, increase or you wanted to perform a regular X update, right? Like this typical adagrad or using the typical adaptive step size. So, he, so this is why the max operator would actually help you to adjust the learning speed between X player and Y player. So why do we choose different alpha and beta, right? So, so again, if you look at the step size ratio between eta X and eta Y, Right, by definition, right, eta x is going to be smaller than this eta x divided by vy to the power of alpha. Eta y is going to be uh, equal to this, 
And this is basically equal to eta x over eta y times this, this constant here. Uh, this, this term here, and you see if alpha is greater than beta, that means this ex exponent here is always positive, meaning that this term will actually always decrease, diminishing to zero, right? That means as t is, if t is sufficiently large, then this ratio will essentially satisfy the time scale separation that you will need, right? That's time scale separation is, is usually like one over kappa, but we don't know kappa. But now, because of this choice of alpha and beta, you can automatically achieve that time scale separation you need. So these are basically the intuition behind, and we can also easily validate this in, in through examples, right? So for example, in this uh, same example we see before, if we just directly use other grad, it will basically diverge. But uh, if we use uh, our framework, it will actually converge. And you can also actually plot out what is the time scale uh, the, the learning rate ratio between them, and you can see that the learning rate ratio, effective learning rate ratio, is actually decreasing, right? And at some point, right, here is basically the, the cutoff where you need it to guarantee convergence. And you see before you reach this uh, cutoff uh, threshold, which is one over uh, kappa, Actually, before that, right, because your learning rate ratio is too large, right, then you actually see, uh, you know, divergence behavior initially. But after you reach this uh, point, you, you, you will start to converge, and you see that your gradient norm will start to decrease, right? So there is really this two-phase in the, in the algorithm, where in stage one, you are really trying to achieve, or your learning rate ratio will decrease, and your gradient norm will increase, and then in the stage two, right, your learning ratio will keep decreasing, right, but your, now you start to see convergence behavior there. And you can also easily see that there is indeed a trade-off between the convergence and also the adaptation, right? So because uh, if you choose alpha, it's very, if the difference between alpha and beta is very large, that means here in this step, you only need a few number of iterations in order to achieve a small threshold. Right, that means you can adapt very fast. But then that means your algorithm would converge slower because you, if alpha is great, much larger than beta, then both of them would be very far away from one half. But one half is actually the one that gives you the optimal rate. Right, so there is, in fact, this trade-off between this convergence rate and how fast you can adapt to the time scale separation. So let me give you, again, the same toy example right, we see before. You see that this uh, algorithm, the other, no matter how you choose your initial step size ratio, it will actually always converge. And actually, it converges much faster than all these other naive adaptive gradient methods or this nested framework in this, in this simple example. So in theory, we can also prove convergence and show that this algorithm actually also achieves nearly all the optimal rate. Right, particularly in deterministic case, no matter how you choose alpha and the beta, right, as long as alpha is greater than beta, you can always get this uh, optimal convergence rate for a deterministic setting. Uh, and in the stochastic setting where you have noise in your gradient, we've shown that the, the rate is going to be dependent on how you choose alpha and the beta. And if alpha and the beta are arbitrarily close to one half, then this gives you the optimal rate. Right? The optimal choice is, in fact, when alpha is arbitrarily close to beta, then both of these gives you uh, one over square root of t convergence rate. Some numerical experiments, like for adversarial training uh, with uh, distribution robust optimization, right? We, I think the resolution is not very high here. I'm not sure you can see clearly. These blue curves are the uh, Tiada algorithm that we propose, and then this. Uh, uh, Green curve is the Adam algorithm. Green and the uh, and the red one are Adam algorithm using different uh, uh, using different uh, inner loops, right? So so basically, if you set i equal to one, the, the this is basically okay. Here is Adam. Here is Adam grad. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly because even me standing here I cannot see it very clearly. Okay, so in any case, you can see that this behaves much more robust compared to Adam because Adam actually 
uh, using different inner loops, it will actually give you quite different performance. And also you see that uh, the performance is significantly better actually than using other. Same on like uh, training games on the CIFAR 10 example, you see that uh, this uh, dotted curves are for Adam using different uh, step size, using different eta x and eta y. And you see that the performance Adam is actually very sensitive to how you choose eta x and eta y, right? In some cases, it actually gives you very good performance like here, but in other cases, it's like super bad. But for the TIADA algorithm that we propose is much more robust to how you choose this step size eta x and eta y. Always give you consistent behaviors. Right, just to, to kind of summarize here, we see that basically the min max optimization is fundamentally different from the minimization setting. Right, because you need to design adaptive methods that can adapt to the time scale separation that you need in order to guarantee convergence. And, and these two algorithms that we, we, two ideas, essentially very generic ideas, one is to using this nested loop framework, or the other one that uses max operator to coordinate the step size are useful to guarantee that you will be able to achieve both parameter agnosticity and also to achieve near, near optimal convergence rate. And I think this is my last slide. I'm running a bit fast today. And uh, of course, this is the end of the slide, but not the, the end of this, I think, this quest of adaptive methods. And I would say there are lots of open questions uh, still remains un, unresolved, right? The number one question is, so we have shown that this uh, benefit of adaptive methods, like the strict advantage is, is that you can improve this constant factor, right? Get rid of this exponential dependence while maintaining the same convergence rate. But in practice, uh, oftentimes what we observe is that this algorithm, like adaptive methods, converge much faster in some cases than, than stochastic gradient descent. And in some applications, we observe that adaptive methods is able to actually escape from subtle points and it is able to generalize much better. But of course, in some applications, in other applications, I think in, in vision applications, people observe completely the contrary. Right, they've shown that uh, adaptive methods are more likely to convert to a sharp minimum, uh, like flat minimum, sorry, uh, like the sharp minimum, while the stochastic gradient descent is more likely to convert to the flat, flat minimum, right? Means that when you convert to the flat minimum, oftentimes that gives you better generalization. So there are a lot of these mixed uh, observations about, you know, this generalization behaviors of this algorithm, which cannot be fully explained completely just from the convergence rate. So, so this is really just a one dimension of the story. And we, we also discussed uh, a lot of this complexity analysis for uh, other grad type of uh, algorithms, but then, uh, and also even for AMS grad, but for Adam, I think there's still a lot of work to be done because this is a bit more sophisticated than these other algorithms. And the analysis is heavily non-trivial. And, and the, the last uh, uh, kind of question is that when we try to use the cast gradient descent with optimally tuned step size, oftentimes we not only get the optimal rate, but we also get the optimal dependence on these constant factors like L and sigma. Right, but when we use adaptive methods, of course, we, we do get optimal rate, but oftentimes we do get much worse constant dependence, right? So, so it remains kind of very unclear whether there is a fundamental difference. If you don't know any knowledge about the underlying smoothness or variance of your gradient, does that mean that necessarily you will have a worse dependence on these constants? So, so far, most of the lower bounds that we see in the literature is only, only applies to the case where you know these constants, right? There is no lower bound where, you know, applies to cases where you don't know these constants like L and sigma, et cetera. So there is, I think, a big, a big gap in the, in the literature there. And when we move on to like min max optimization setting, I think what I've shown here is that you can design algorithms that are parameter agnostic with optimal uh, convergence rate. But then we also see that, uh, you know, there is this trade-off, right, between how fast it can converge and uh, 
how fast it will adapt to the time scale separation. And it's not clear like whether there's a way that you can adaptively achieve this optimal trade-off there. And also so far the analysis applies to mostly to non-convex settings with strongly concave uh, uh, maximization problem. And it's also not clear like in other settings like non-convex concave or if both X and Y are fully non-convex, do you still need to, do you need to design different algorithms or whether this algorithm will converge? And we see also like uh, uh, the way that we achieve this uh, adaptivity is really by coordinating the step size. But in practice, due to privacy considerations, maybe different agents do not want to share the gradient information. If they don't share the gradient information, right, then how can you achieve this uh, adaptive step size, right? Then can we actually do independent learning and make it adaptive, right? This is still unknown. And then also how do we generalize this to multiplayer games rather than just two players? And I think there are lots, lots of open questions that that worth investigating on this domain. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I'll just conclude here and uh, here are the uh, related papers uh, of this talk. And thank you for your attention, yeah. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for the interesting mm -hmm. talk. Uh, you have the slide where you have the uh, quotient with the V to the alpha minus beta uh -huh. Uh -huh. in the denominator. Uh -huh. And you said that it's going to push to this. Um, to, yeah, to, to this time scale separation. Uh, right. But like this V, could it be like smaller than one or larger than one and then push to one or the other regime? Right. Anyway? So the V, the way how we update the V is uh, in most of these uh, algorithms like Adagrad and Adam, right? Let me just give you one example. Here with Ad Adagrad, how we update V. Right, so this is basically how you update uh, V. Uh, maybe like an easier example here. So the way how you update the V is by aggregating all of these gradient norms, right? So the more iterations you have, then the larger V is. So V essentially will become very large, right? It will keep increasing. Yeah. Um, a related question mm -hmm. would be, um, could you, make alpha and beta equal, mm -hmm. but uh, incorporate like a factor of one over square root of t or something like that mm -hmm. to also push this ratio between the two step sizes to mm -hmm. some regime? Uh, that's a very uh, interesting idea. <clears throat> so you can push alpha and beta to be uh, close to each other to uh, here, sorry. Right, you can you can push alpha and beta arbitrarily close to each other, but then if you look at the effective step size, then you would not be able to push this down to zero. You're saying if you add an extra term, then this would work. Then I, I would say that's then similar to using this alpha and beta. Yeah. Maybe, but it's slightly different because there you control square root of t, but rather here you control the v. Okay. So maybe, yeah. Right. My uh -huh. worry here is uh -huh. that uh, this algorithm is not invariant under rescaling because uh -huh. you don't have uh, one half as the exponent. Uh -huh. So maybe that would be good for invariance to rescale. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. Yeah, uh, I have to uh, yeah investigate on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned, well, you showed some results. Uh, first, thank you very much for the very, mm -hmm. very uh, interesting talk. <clears throat> you showed some results on MNIST and uh, Sidebar. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, do you also have results on, let's say, more, um, let's say, more, more complex computer vision tasks, for example? Or, right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the data set, these are still used, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Killer for some mm -hmm. you know, theoretical analysis. Mm -hmm. but I was just wondering about the practical advantage of this right. approach. Because mm -hmm. from these results, it seems like we should all go add them. Mm -hmm. and use your method instead, which mm -hmm. yeah, I would love to do and tell mm -hmm. my students to do as well. But mm -hmm. 
I was wondering if you have some insights into yeah, performance on, let's say, more Task. Right, that's a very good question. So, so far I would say that in most of these experiments we have run, right, uh, one of the phenomenon, as many of you could uh, already expect, is that this algorithm gives you good training error. It's much faster than Adam in terms of achieving faster convergence here in terms of training error. But when you look at the testing error, Oftentimes, right, the ones that gives you better training error gives you worse testing error, right? It tends to generalize worse, right? That's also what we have observed as well, right? We tried to use much uh, more complicated vision tasks and also generate images and it turns out that it just generalize worse. And, and I think there is this fundamental thing that we observe in most algorithms if you, yeah, if it trains faster than it generalize worse. And this cannot be somehow explained by any of the theory so far. Yeah. Right. That would have been my next question. So is there mm -hmm. a beginning of understanding of why that mm -hmm. is? Or are you actively exploring this question of why that is? Right. We are actively exploring this uh, in terms of uh, in the aspect that uh, uh, what do we mean by when do we have good generalization, right? Good generalization, as I said, one particular example is when if you converge, like, because all these are non-convex problems, they could converge to different stationary points, right? So stationary points that gives you, like, that uh, lives in, like, in the flat regimes are usually gives you better generalization, right? Stationary points that gives you, like, in the sharp regimes that gives you bad generalization. Right, so, so one of the kind of what we are right now looking into is to see, right, like to try to explain or try to understand whether adaptive methods actually is able to, uh, is more easy to generalize or to, to converge to these uh, flat regimes compared to stochastic gradient descent. And that might be also a bit intuitive, not too surprising, right, because in the the way how we do adaptive gradient methods, right? If you think about uh, kind of the way that we update most adaptive methods, is really by using this uh, gradient norm information. Uh, say for instance here. And this is of course the norm version of it. But then this, in a way that mimics the Hessian information somehow, right? The diagonal information of your Hessian. And that's why this, using this type of uh, adaptive step size can help you to leverage some of the curvature information to, to converge to better stationary points. I think there were some results shown that uh, this helps you to escape from other points. But escaping from other points does not necessarily mean you can converge to a flat regime. Right. I think that there is still something to be done there, and uh, we are looking into this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I may, just a quick yes. follow-up. Uh -huh. um, and, and can you already say or quantify like how how much worse um, your method is in terms of you know test performance? Mm -hmm. like, is it all of magnitude, or is it just a small? It's going to still pay off, kind of, just mm -hmm. this larger. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> despite maybe the, the smaller mm -hmm. or worse mm -hmm. general ability. Right. I think it's just a bit, uh, a bit worse. Uh, for this one example I showed with the uh, CIFAR 10, that one is actually for the test, uh, for the testing performance. That is the one that we observe better performance on testing. But for other data sets, uh, so I have two examples here. For MNIST, this is for testing. And uh, in the, uh, for training, and in the testing, ours is worse, but only slightly worse. That's why I'm not reporting the figures here. This one is actually for testing. This one is better, yeah. So it uh, sometimes depends on really on the different uh, data sets and different tasks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No, so very interesting. Uh, I, was, I was wondering a little bit more uh, on, from an abstract point of view in adaptive methods. The, the question is always whether you can trade off rate for the constant, right? So mm -hmm. in, in these mm -hmm. questions, it's it's what you showed in the beginning with the SGD, with mm -hmm. the step size. Mm -hmm. So the question, with an adaptive step size. Mm -hmm. So the question that I had was with respect to, okay, these new parameters that we have to play with, like alpha and beta, mm -hmm. or in the other case, um, well, there was an alpha there. Yeah. So how, this, how, how the actual performance of the algorithm in practice, mm -hmm. which is going to depend on those constants that you mm -hmm. get, not only on the rate, 
How sensitive is it to actually those parameters being adjusted? Because mm -hmm. ultimately, I'm going to mm -hmm. have to adjust mm -hmm. those parameters also right. with respect to mm -hmm. the smoothness of the function that right. is underlying, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. To get a good performance that yeah. is not very good in mm -hmm. theory, so I get mm -hmm. a good rate, but then it ends up very, mm -hmm. very slow in practice mm -hmm. because alpha and beta just sort of make all <coughs> my step sizes go very small and right. everything works, but mm -hmm. then, you know, I, I have very small. Right, that's a, a very uh, good uh, point. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> it's true that there are other hyperparameters in many of these algorithms, right? Like, say, for instance, in Adam, you have this, uh, say, beta 1, beta right. 2, right? So there are all these hyperparameters. There is also the hyperparameter about this gamma in the step size, which depends on the smoothness. And I think what's observed in practice is the algorithm is more sensitive this step size, uh, this hyperparameter in the learning rate, rather than this hyperparameter beta 1, beta 2. Right, so, so different choice, like usually, I think what people do is they just fix beta 1 to be like 0.99. Yeah. They don't tune it actually because there is not too much difference between 0.99 from 0.9 or 0.999, right? So, so these are less sense. I, I would say the algorithm is less sensitive to this type of hyperparameter. So usually that's why we ignore it, and we care more about the the the, the, the learning rate. Yeah. Right, right. But mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I mean, like in your in our algorithm, yeah, right. uh -huh. I mean, yeah, what's yeah. What's your experience with? Uh -huh. Right. Before, right. <laughs> right. I mean, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> what's your experience with you know? How sensitive the tuning of these parameters actually is, especially in the mm -hmm. min max case, mm -hmm. where, you know, mm -hmm. stopping in quotes the algorithm by right. setting alpha and beta mm -hmm. separately mm -hmm. uh, has this tendency of, mm -hmm. you know, in the min max you have these diverging mm -hmm. uh, problem, these diverging, right. sorry, these diverging dynamics. Yeah. I'm a little bit sleepy still. Mm -hmm. um, or already, I'm not sure. It's, uh, <laughs> um, they have these diverging mm -hmm. dynamics that converge mm -hmm. on average, but don't mm -hmm. converge always. So stopping. Right, that's a good point. I did not include the figure here. We did run some experiments. Like in most of these experiments I show you, where I just simply choose alpha to be 0.6 and beta to be 0.4, fixed. We didn't tune it at all for all these experiments. But we did run some sensitivity analysis, choosing different alpha and beta, right? 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, or both of them arbitrarily close to 0.5. And it turns out there is not significant difference there. So that means that there is maybe some, like the analysis we have here might not fully capture right. this phenomenon. And that there is room to improve the analysis there. And it's not an issue with the algorithm looks like, yeah. Uh -huh. But that's a very good point, yeah. Yes, please. I mean, you mentioned that uh, sometimes uh, one observes that uh, certain algorithms perform way better than mm -hmm. the theory uh, would explain. Mm -hmm. But the theory, of course, is some sort of a worst case uh, right. scenario theory. Yes. Uh -huh. So, do you have any idea what additional assumptions could be which are A, realistic on optimization problems at hand, mm -hmm. and B, would also lead to better rates? Mm -hmm. uh, also very good and also very challenging question, I'd say. Uh, of course, like a lot of these analysis we have shown, right, these are worst case performance, right? Uh, even the lower bound we prove are like for worst case performance. But in practice, you know, oftentimes we see more like average performance, right? And uh, there is, I think there is some ongoing research on this domain to see what are the average case complexity rather than worst case complexity. But then this is also very challenging to analyze because uh, you are then analyzing not the class of problem, like you're analyzing now a random class of problem class or function class, right, that you're trying to minimize. You see what is the average performance over this random family of functions or family of random functions. And so far, I think the only results I know only apply to like quadratic functions, like least square type of problems. People are able to analyze the average performance and provide much tighter characterizations of the convergence behavior. Say, for instance, in the worst case, we show stochastic gradient descent converge in the order of 1 over t for least square problem. But in the average case, you can show even linear convergence there. But then these are oftentimes restricted to very specific problems. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to derive them or analyze them for a bit more general objectives. Yeah. So there is the, the dynamic there, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but I, I think yeah, but I think this is uh, larger than open area for for research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I from the Institute of Computer Architecture, so my perspective is more hardware based, and I don't have a deep knowledge about mm -hmm. the methods you showed today. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me if my question does not make much sense. Is it possible for, or let me let me face it, um, we are working on some hardware based defenses um, against adversarial attacks and trying some experiments with that. Mm -hmm. And we have an approach which uses some hardware that produces approximate or randomized results to defend against simple adversarial attacks on image classification networks. Um, so I would assume from, from what I know and from what I got from your uh, presentation that if you have um, a method that converges in a flat minimum, which generalizes better, mm -hmm. it would be a bit worse performing if you have randomized operations in a network than a method that converges towards a sharp minimum. Um, as I believe you're, you showed that your method is noise adaptive, so it would probably be able to handle a bit of noise in the network. Is there a way to force the TADA algorithm, for example, to converge more likely towards a flat minimum or more likely towards a sharp minimum, depending on the parameters chosen? Mm -hmm. Do you think this is possible, or is that more, or does it depend on the, on the, on the problem? Uh, right, I, I think so far <clears throat> we have we, we can only show convergence to stationary points, and I think it could be possible to show this type of results of convergence to flat minimum, but then under some additional modification of the algorithm or with additional assumptions. And the noise adaptive here, what we mean by noise adaptive, which is again one of the key features people claim adaptive methods are good is because uh, by noise adaptive, we, we mean that we don't need to know how large is the noise, right? The algorithm will automatically choose the step size for you, right? Say, for instance, if uh, in for gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, we know if there is no noise, you use a constant step size. If there is noise, you use decay in step size, right? Then you have to ch change your step size to adapt to which problem setting you have. But with adaptive, other grad or adaptive methods, you don't need to adjust your step size to be constant or diminishing, depending on whether there is a noise, right? It's just automatically based on the gradient information, it can do it for you. That's what I mean by noise adaptive, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you're welcome, yeah. Another question, yeah, yes. another, uh -huh. very practical one. So is uh -huh. the code of your methods available? Yes. Uh -huh. It doesn't say on these slides, or I missed it, sorry. Right, this is available, it's on GitHub, but I think this is usually required for all these machine learning conference submissions, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was just wondering, it looks like because I didn't right. see it on the slides, but uh -huh. it's great, so I can point uh -huh. my, my students to Okay, me. right. Yes, yeah. uh, you mentioned this uh, exponential dependence on this hyperparameter for the uh, optimization uh -huh. case. Uh -huh. uh, could this, I mean, just from looking at the formula, uh -huh. maybe just defects by uh -huh. choosing it very small. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not really exponential. Right. If you choose eta to be very small, right, uh, smaller than 1 over L, then it's not, you don't have exponential factor anymore. But then that means you need to know how small you need, right? means that you need to know L to be able to know how small eta should be. Yes, but could mm -hmm. I maybe practically just say, I don't know how, what this else would precisely mean, then how, oh, how okay. smooth things so L smooth means that uh, uh, the gradient uh, uh, or the Hessian is bounded by L. Let's put it that way. Or the, uh, the gradient is L Lipschitz continuous, right? It's known that for neural networks, the smoothness, right? When you use like uh, neural networks, the, the, the Lipschitz constants can be very bad, can be very large actually. And also it's very hard to estimate it. For, of course, for quadratics, Right, like least square type problem is easy to estimate L, right? These are going to be the maximum eigenvalues of your feature matrix, right? But then for, for neural networks, right, usually it's very hard to estimate L, right? In practice, what people can do is through nine search to estimate L, but then doing nine search requires you to evaluate your true function over your whole data set, and that's very expensive. Uh, you just said, no, I Zero, 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 one. Uh -huh. Maybe that's good enough. 
It might be good enough for some applications, some data set, but might be not enough for other application, right? Whole point here is you wanted to make it work for any data set, any application. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's yeah. another issue. It cannot be too small. Too small means too slow. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so here in this bound, it looks like choosing it too small doesn't change anything. But yeah. uh, like, is there another expression for this bound which somehow involves something like one over eta or something? Oh, right. That's a very small. good point. It's, yes. It's a good question. <laughs> It's a very good point. Yes, there is there is dependence on eta here, but it's polynomial order. Like yeah, so if eta is uh, there's I think there is one over eta somewhere here, so eta cannot be arbitrarily close to zero. Yeah, but that's a very good point. I fix it. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the fruitful discussion. Yeah, yeah and engagement. Yeah. <laughs> This is not the case. Let's yeah. thank her again okay. for this yeah. very interesting talk. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm.